very much for coming to this session. Uh, I'm very happy to have, uh, for the first time uh, in the same room, well, except for Katya, which is online in the same room, um, uh, the four authors of uh, the three reports uh, that uh, made a breakthrough last year uh, regarding uh, our understanding of air quality in Bishkek, and that we are now uh, hoping to use as the foundation for uh, uh, actually taking action to resolve or to at least improve uh, the situation uh, in Bishkek. So we have Katya Loven from uh, uh, the Finnish Meteorological Institute, uh, who worked on the UNDP UNEP report. Uh, we have uh, uh, Jay uh, Turner and Rufus Edwards who worked on the UNICEF report. And we have uh, uh, Zulaika uh, Esenteva who worked on the IOM, uh, uh, International Organization of uh, Migrations uh, uh, report. Um, Katya, the floor is yours. You have 12 minutes uh, and we'll keep the questions for the end. Uh, uh, so, so, so we can uh, all discuss that uh, uh, after all the presentation. Katya, floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon uh, from Finland, dear uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen of the conference. Uh, I'm very happy to present you, to give you an overview to the study funded by uh, UNEP and UNDP on air quality in Bishkek. And the aim of this study was to analyze all the air quality information that there actually exists at the moment and to give a scientific background and evidence of the air pollution. And also based on that uh, scientific evidence to also to identify the main emission sources impacting the poor air quality to, to in Bishkek. And then they also the study resulted uh, the roadmap and some recommendations on what to do on, on the journey towards the clean, clean air. So what uh, actions would need to be taken. So basically this study was the first of the kind. So the, that meets the um, scientific criteria, or it was very detailed, comprehensive analysis of the expert organization on on what what kind of scientific evidence there is on, on the air quality. So basically, the uh, concentrations of different pollutants that have been measured almost ten years now in Bishkek were analyzed very detailed. And different tools, actually, it was not only one station or two station data that was used to give the scientific evidence, but there was uh, also other sources of the data. So the main sources were um, uh, Kirkis Hydromet, multi-component air quality station that has been operating since 2015, measuring uh, all the priority pollutants in the air, air uh, in real time. Then there was U.S. Embassy PM 2.5 data used, and also a several tens of sensors that are also measuring air quality around the Bishkek. Also, uh, the satellite data was used to give uh, also the uh, general picture of the whole country and the area in, 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 um, in Central Asia on air quality. Then we did carry out also some uh, modeling case studies, modeling the CHP plant and how much emissions impact uh, to the air quality from this major energy production plant and also this uh, uh, private house heating in winter time. Uh, then one very important source are the, also the emission inventories. So calculating how much emissions, different emission sources like traffic, energy production, industry, and so on, how they, how much they cost different type of emissions. And also this was included and in different scenarios based on these emission inventories were uh, calculated in this project. Very important, we have to remember also that in addition to the emissions, very important, uh, factor impacting to the air quality are the meteorological conditions and the geography. For example, in Kyrgyzstan and Bishkek, 
The big mountains affect a lot to the air quality, making sometimes the mixing of the air very limited when the emissions are concentrated nearby the breeding level. Now that's that's the one cause of the poor air quality in winter time. We can go for the next, please. So then uh, based on this uh, analysis, it's a uh, very clear that the Bishkek experience is poor air quality most uh, throughout the year, but especially in winter time, the concentrations are peaking very high and they actually exceed all the international health base uh, uh, limit values for the, for the air quality, also the national guidelines. And this, of course, causes health impact to the people, negative, he negative health impacts, even deaths. So it's been estimated that approximately 5,000 deaths per year in Kyrgyz Republic are caused by the poor, uh, uh, related to the air pollution. Also, healthcare cost, related healthcare cost, because people are getting different kinds of symptoms, they are getting sick, they are very high. So that's why it's important in the very also high uh, management level to really start actions towards the cleaner air. Next, please. Uh, and when there are a lot of different type of emissions and concentrations in the air of different type of pollutants, we also um, uh, found out that which are the most, let's say, critical in case of Bishkek. And in general, in the whole world, these fine particulates, PM2.5, are the priority pollutants that cause the most of the negative health effects. And the same is for Bishkek. So basically, it's the PM2.5, the tiny, small particulates that go actually through the lungs, also to our uh, different parts of the body, and they cause uh, severe health effects. Also, what is typical for the Bishkek is that the sulfur dioxide concentrations are peaking, typically same time with the PM2.5, which is the one of the, uh, um, let's say, the um, uh, cause because the, uh, the coal is burned in winter time to heat the houses. So these two are correlating at the same time. That actually points out and it um, makes it easier to identify also that uh, these emissions are very strongly related to the heating and, and the use of the coal for heating. Okay, we can go for the next, please. And here are some pictures, demonstrations of how actually the um, PM uh, 2.5 from the different emission, emission uh, sources are originating. And this, this um, these pictures are for the modeling and these are from the small houses. So we have probably the next one is for the energy production units. Next slide, please. This one. So we can see that actually in comparison, these uh, energy production plants that uh, most of the people in Bishkek know because it has the high stacks that, uh, that uh, produces the, big, let's say the most important uh, share of the electricity used in Bishkek and Kyrgyzstan, this uh, coal fire power plant. And of course, everybody can see and think that, okay, that plant is the main emission source, but also it has a high stacks. So actually by the modeling that was carried out within the study, it shows that it's not so big, the impact of this kind of uh, 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 energy production plant, the CHP plant. But if we go one back, uh, uh, backwards, these small houses, because um, the uh, the concentrations caused by the small houses burning the coal is actually much more significant for the air quality because the emissions are released in the very close by the breeding level, and also the burning of the coal in the private house is much more unclean, which results higher emissions as well. Okay, we can go. Uh, to next and the next one as well. Uh, also the uh, detailed study studies of the uh, calculations of the emission inventory. So how much emissions on different uh, emission sources are caused uh, 
pointed out that the traffic in Bishkek is one of the priority emission sources as well. And of course, the traffic emissions, they are uh, they impact the air quality uh, most si significantly nearby the roadsides. So when we are close by the uh, heavily trafficked roads, then also the emissions and the air quality caused by the traffic emissions are, are higher nearby the roads. But uh, when we talk about this kind of heating related emissions, then those are in the suburban areas where people live and where they heat the houses. So a little bit different factors have a different share for the poor air quality, depending which part of the city people are. And we are exposed to them. Okay, we can go to the next. Then in addition to the uh, these private uh, house heating emissions and the traffic, there seems to be also uh, 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 emissions to the air related to the waste waste burning and burning of all kind of residual materials waste. So this is a, one of the also um, impact to the poor air quality. So it's very important to build up the strategies and uh, and also uh, actions towards the efficient waste management and also build that, building up the awareness that people know that when you burn waste, it's an unclean burning and that results in very toxic particulates uh, that impacts to the health. So this is the one, one of, uh, of the points that should be also considered in the awareness building. And then the next, please. And if, if let's say if the same trends for the emissions continue, it seems that the emissions will be higher because more people are moving to the city and more there are more cars, more emissions. So if nothing changes, the air quality will not get better. It actually goes worse. So that's why it's very important to have a different, different kind of actions to reduce the emissions from the traffic and the different sectors to actually reduce the emissions because otherwise there will be only, it gets worse. So basically this kind of emission inventories give an idea that if we, if we, for example, change the buses to the electrical bus, how they reduce the emissions and then result cleaner air as well. Next, please. So basically the main, uh, how to, what are the solutions to improve the air quality? We would say that the priority focus would be to actually on the uh, to offering the affordable access to clean household energy solutions because that would support on the heating of the private houses and related emissions as well. And uh, this is of course the big picture, but nevertheless, this is one of the priority priority actions. Next, please. Then this, uh, this report includes the roadmap, how to enhance the air quality management. Air quality management includes other things also than the air quality measurements, that's the one part. Then the actions on, on how to actually build up, up the targeted uh, emission reduction policies, that's important. And this is included into the report. And this report is available in the UNEP and UND websites in English, Kyrgyzstan and Russian languages. So if you are interested, I don't go into the details of the roadmap, but nevertheless, it gives a guidance for the, for the government and um, expert organizations dealing with the air quality, how to improve the air quality situation. And then next. So this is important picture. So we, we need to have the air quality measurement. We need to have the good quality data and reliable data to understand what's the air quality. And then to analyze that whether the air quality exceeds the health-based limit values. And if it exceeds, we have to analyze the data to understand why does it exceed? What is causing it? And this is where we need the data so that we ana can analyze and understand better. And, and based on this understanding, we can then develop air quality plans and programs to actually improve the air quality. And then we go back to the air quality measurement network that it's important to have a good network to understand that whether our policies, legislation, 
equality, action plans, whether they are impacting to the equality. But this is the slow work. So it takes five to 10 years to actually see the difference. So because the years are different. Okay, then we can go for the wrap up. Next. This is good to uh, also to remember that when we tackle the air pollution, we also help on fighting the climate change because the emission sources for the greenhouse gases and air pollutants are the same. So they go hand in hand. So the same actions towards the clean air, getting rid, rid of fossil fuels and replacing them with the renewable energies that helps to benefit in both of these problems. Thank you. And then the next one, I think we are. Okay, thank you so much. So this was, there was also some recommendations of the what to do when the air quality is bad. So basically how to protect yourself on that. So I don't go any more on the details, but, um, but thank you so much for the attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Katia. I'm sorry, sorry for pressing you a bit uh, uh, in uh, the back, uh, on the back side. Um, Jay, Rufus, the floor is yours. Thank you for the opportunity to spend a few minutes with you. Rufus Edwards and I will be jointly discussing with you the work that we've been doing to understand the health and social impacts of air pollution here in Bishkek. Is this better? Okay, thank you. So first we would like to acknowledge the many people and organizations that were involved in this work. Our team itself, uh, has contributions from companies here in Bishkek, as well as international collaborators on the scientific side. And also, of course, this work was funded by UNICEF, and we have Tomoya here, Sonata from UNICEF. But we also significantly benefited from this network of low-cost particulate matter sensors distributed across the city of Bish Bishkek. So very important to acknowledge colleagues at the Asian Development Bank, including Jules, Kyrgyz Hydromet, and the company Clarity, that, whose sensors it is, and they were deeply invested in this project themselves. The final report from our project was issued in April 2023, and it's available on the UNICEF Kyrgyzstan website. There were many different elements to this project, much beyond the scope of what we can discuss today. The main objectives, as I stated in the title, were to examine the health and the social impacts of PM 2.5, what Katya was focusing on in the previous presentation, on, on children and on women in Bishkek. We also wanted to understand what are the entry points or access points for organizations like the UN agencies, such as UNEP, to contribute to the discussion about interventions to reduce air pollution and exposures here. So this flowchart shows the main elements of our work, but what we'll be focusing on today in my presentation is the outdoor urban air quality assessment. The indoor-outdoor relationships, because we spend most of our time indoors, leading to the estimation of exposures, Rufus will pick up at that point with the exposures, the health impacts, and the economic burdens. Beyond the scope of today, perhaps, depending on if Rufus has time, is a, an additional more economic analysis looking at a willingness to pay or a value of a statistical life analysis which helps us put it in a broader economic context, the health impacts and what the benefits would be of reducing air pollution. 
So we, again, as I stated, we benefited from this Asian Development Bank, Kyrgyz Hydromet, low cost sensor network, which has 50 sites across the city. And when we validated the data, we were able to use 37 of those sites for our analysis. And what we see here is the larger the circle, the higher the air pollution over a 12 month period. The gradient or difference across the city is a factor of four. Now to put that in context, in my city in the United States, the variation is about 15%. Here it's 400%. So when we're conducting a health analysis or understanding interventions, we need to appreciate the large differences in air pollution and thus exposures across the city. We see mostly polluted on the west, north, and eastern sides. The south side is relatively clean, relatively, still polluted. Where AUCA is located, the air quality is relatively good compared to the rest of the city. And note that the city center is not the most polluted area, which is what a lot of people often think. It's actually on the cleaner side. And this reflects back on the relative role of transportation for example, compared to other sources. Also important here is the gray triangle in the Southwest section. That's the US Embassy. And historically, the US Embassy monitor has been used to gauge air quality in Bishkek because the data is publicly available in real time. But as you can see, it's actually in the cleanest part of the city and does not reflect what most people in the city are experiencing. Now, important to the story, as Katya already explained, is the role of residential heating with coal. As part of this study, a survey was conducted of 1,007 households, very carefully designed where the data would be collected to understand how are people heating their homes. And the circle in the top left shows how people are heating their homes. And I draw your attention to the two green colors 25% of the population in Bishkek is heating their homes with coal burning in their house. Now, what distinguishes the coal burning here in homes from say in Mongolia, where Rufus and I have been working for 14 years now, is in Mongolia, it's mostly people with very low income burning coal. But as we see in the red bars across the bottom graph here, this is who is, what, how are people heating their home with the red being coal and the x-axis is income from low to high. And even high income households are burning coal. That presents a distinct opportunity here because they have the opportunity to purchase certain devices that perhaps lower income households do not. So again, very different from what we see in certain other countries where it's only the poor people burning coal. So we talk about entry points or access points for intervention. This graph is very important. Now to build the weight of evidence that indeed residential coal burning is the biggest concern, I'm showing here two pieces of data from our study put together. First is the colors. This is what we call a heat map showing the air pollution levels now spatially modeled from that Asian Development Bank, Kyrgyz Hydromet network. And we see the light yellow is the clean areas, the dark red is the most polluted areas. That's unfortunate. Ah, it's coming back, wonderful. All right, we'll slowly get there. I like the panel. I feel like a game show host or something. Okay, that's all we need for the story. The gray bars represent from our survey of 1,000 households, the primary way people are heating their homes. The higher the gray bar means the larger percentage of people in that neighborhood burning coal. And what we see is a very strong correlation. In the Southern part of the city, essentially nobody is burning coal. And in all the high pollution areas, the coal is the dominant source because the gray bars are quite high. So this builds a very strong, what we call weight of evidence, linking the survey data of primary home heating together with the outdoor air pollution data. 
Now, the left plot is showing on the x-axis the annual PM 2.5 concentration, and the y-axis is the fraction of people that are living in an area with that certain level of pollution. So what we see is in the middle at 0.5, we go across, and depending on the way we look at households, we see that about half the people in the city at a value of 0.5, depending on our method, are, are living in an area with outdoor air pollution of 35 to 40 microgram per cubic meter. Now that's often what's used in a study. What's the average pollution across the city? But in Bishkek, as we said, a factor of four difference in outdoor air pollution means that some people are in very clean areas, other people in very polluted areas. And that's what the right-hand graph shows. On the left side is the annual average air pollution level. On the right side is the World Health Organization guideline in green and various interim target levels. And what we see is that 10% of the population in Bishkek is exposed to concentrations of about 20 microgram per cubic meter. That comes from the left-hand plot, which is somewhere between World Health Organization or interim targets two and three. The goal is the green line. Half the population is worse than interim target one, very far from the green line. And 10% is off the scale above 60%. These people are in highly polluted areas of the city. So using that average or mean value of 40 is very misleading in a city like Bishkek, where 10% of your population is at concentrations of 60, which is 12 times what the World Health Organization recommends. Now, the outdoor air that I've been showing you is not the air people breathe 24 hours a day because we spend most of our time indoors. So we conducted a study of 48 households measuring simultaneously at the household itself, outdoor and indoor air pollution. And I'm showing you just one example here of seven days on the x-axis and the one hour average air pollution on the y-axis. This is a home that was burning coal. Outdoor is in red, indoor is in green. And what you see is the indoor air pollution is about half of the outdoor air pollution. In, in some places, not here in our data, but in other parts of the world, indoor might be higher than outdoor. And people often assume if you're burning coal, that's the case, but it's not true if you have a chimney and your stove is working properly. So we see the red is the outdoor, the green is the indoor, but note that they're tightly moving together. And this is very strong evidence that your largest source of indoor air pollution is outdoor air that's actually coming inside and not indoor sources. So that's very important. So two points, outdoor air coming in dominates indoor air pollution and indoor is half of outdoors and that's where people spend most of their time. We see that this value of about half indoor being half of outdoor is the same regardless of whether you have a coal stove, central heating or pipeline gas, it doesn't matter. Because what matters is simply that late that rate at which outdoor air is leaking indoors. That's what matters, not the way you're heating your home. I'm gonna skip this slide because of time and instead come to the summary. So first we see that this network that was, that was assembled by Kyrgyz Hydromet with funding from Asian Development Bank allowed us to identify the spatial variability across the city, very large, enabled us to estimate exposure to air pollution at one square kilometer resolution. That's very high resolution for a city of this size. We didn't talk about it, the ability, it would have been the previous slide, showing the mountain valley effect, where you can clearly see every day in the mid afternoon and winter, air quality is the cleanest because of the effect of airflow as it's affected by the mountains by time of day. Taking that network with our household survey, we again really strengthened the evidence about the dominant role of, of the residential coal stoves regarding air pollution in this city. And the indoor outdoor modeling was critical to generate the data for our exposure modeling. And it identified indoor air, air quality is dominated by the outdoor air coming in. 
And so lastly, the key messages, again, large disparities in exposure, that the interventions need to be at the neighborhood level. If I have a coal stove and I replace that with a heat pump, it's not going to improve my air quality very much. What I need is to have my whole neighborhood change over to heat pumps. It has to be a neighborhood scale intervention to see the effect. Okay? Absent or at least in addition to emission reductions, there are household levels actions we can take, such as air purifiers or tightening your building envelope to reduce infiltration. And if you're going to be outside, again, I skipped the graph, the mid-afternoon in the winter is the best time to be outside. So with this, I'll turn it over to Rufus, who will now take us from these exposures and concentrations to health impacts. with a little pause. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jay. Um, I'm going to take it out, uh, on from here and really talk about how we then took the spatial concentrations and then estimated health impacts for the population of Bishkek. And in order to do this, first I'm going to start by talking a little bit about what are the health impacts from uh, air pollution because oh. uh, yeah, there we go. So to start off with, air pollution is without doubt one of the great killers of our age, and it's very much under estimated and under recognized in in really in global population in global financing for health even if you look on this graph you see that air pollution far exceeds on a global level both malaria uh, well malaria hiv and tuberculosis combined it's far in excess of that and it is of course the leading environmental risk factor for health uh, in almost every country in the world that we know of, it, it leads in environmental risk factors. In terms of specific health burdens, it's accounting for really about 20% to 25% of non-communicable disease burdens. And this is a major issue. It's almost as big, in fact, as direct uh, cigarette smoking in terms of global burdens. And we'll talk more about that because part of our estimates also uh, don't take into account the additional burden of cigarette smoking that is undertaken by the Kyrgyz population. And if you really want to estimate health impacts, you really have to take all of these into account. Um, now, globally, PM 2.5 is, is the best indicator for health impacts from ambient air pollution and from household air pollution. And it is, uh, based on hundreds of epidemiological studies around the world, that it is the single best predictor. And this doesn't mean that health impacts are not caused by other components of the air pollution mixture. Other components of the air pollution mixture do cause health impacts, but PM 2.5 is the best indicator. And some of the health effects are directly caused by PM 2.5 and some uh, we think that maybe PM 2.5 is acting as an indicator. But in all cases, you know, we will talk for the rest of this talk largely about PM 2.5 because it accounts for the greatest burden. The second largest burden is from ambient ozone. And you know, really, when you look at global burden of disease assessments and burden of disease assessments on a national level, you'll see that it's largely particulate matter and ozone that dominate health impacts. Um, now, globally, there's a large body of evidence and uh, for recognized health impacts by the World Health Organization. And these are ischemic heart disease, stroke, uh, chronic obstructive, uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, lower respiratory infections or, or pneumonia. And we have lung cancer and also diabetes mellitus type 2. And all of these are causally linked to air pollution are, are incorporated in the health impact estimates we're going to talk about. Now, um, 
These are from global studies around the world. But on the top right here, we actually have uh, relationships between coal smoke and mortality per day in England uh, from, uh, and this of course was, uh, it was in fact for after the Clean Air Act was enacted in England. So this is post, this is from, yes, yeah, you can see on the top. this is from 1958 yeah. through 1970. And uh, you will see that with each increase in uh, coal smoke concentrations, there is corresponding increase in deaths per day. And it follows a characteristic shape where it curves over where you saturate the response in a human being. Now, there are, of course, other risks, and particularly to developing children, there are major well-known effects on lung development that air pollution exposures affect lung development throughout the rest of the life. There's reduced fetal growth. This is interuterine growth rate retardation. This is the fetus grows less well or less, uh, less fast in the womb. And this is directly as a result of compromised systems in, in the body as, as the fetus develops. It's also uh, linked to low birth weight, preterm birth, still birth, and DNA, uh, DNA alteration. So this is methylation of your DNA um, that causes uh, you know, long-term effects in, uh, in development later on in life. And, Part of this is related. We'll talk some more about this. We can go into more of these in detail if you would wish. In addition, there's a growing body of evidence that shows that air pollution has direct impacts on uh, cognitive development in the, in the womb and cognitive uh, development in the first and early years of life. In fact, of course, these effects accumulate over the lifespan and air pollution, there's a growing body of evidence uh, now um, throughout the United States that air pollution is linked to neurodegenerative disease later on in life as well. And this is uh, in large part because over time, your blood brain barrier um, uh, gets weaker as you get older. And that's one of the best indicators of neurodegenerative disease. And air pollution is also exacerbates those effects. The inflammation caused by air pollution exacerbates the weakening of the blood-brain barrier, but it also allows more particles to enter into the brain. So um, there are widespread impacts. And one of the most concerning, of course, is in young children that this alters their development potential and their earning potential through the rest of their lives. In addition, this is a graph from the famous London smog episode in England. And this is tracking children that were in the womb and in their first years of life uh, during the London smog episode. And remember, this was only nine days of extremely elevated cold pollution in London. But you can see on the right, if I can get my light to work, um, the red line on the right is for, uh, on the graph, is those children that were in the womb, that were exposed in the womb in the London smog episode. And the blue line is those that were uh, recently born up to three, up to, up to four years old, actually. And what you see is this graph is plotting the increased risk of developing asthma both as childhood asthma and adult asthma. And you see that for those that were in the womb, there's a three times greater risk of developing asthma relative to those that lived outside London at the time of the London smog episode. And for those that were young children during the smog episode, there's a nine times greater risk of developing uh, childhood asthma. And similarly, uh, the increased risk for developing adult asthma as well. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, I'm going to go back to our study and what Jay was talking about and talk about how did we take those data on concentration, what Jay was talking about was concentration data, and how did we figure out what 
people were exposed to? How did we estimate what people were exposed to? And therefore, what are the health impacts on, uh, of uh, air pollution or PM 2.5 in the population? And the biggest thing to really recognize amongst our data is not only uh, is there you know, reduction in air pollution concentrations as you move to indoor environments, but as the Kyrgyz data itself shows that adults actually spend uh, most of their time in the winter in indoor environments. So in fact, all of your air pollution that you breathe practically comes from indoor environments. That's where you spend your time. That's what causes the health impacts in the individual. So it's really critical that, to understand that it's the air that's infiltrating in, into your buildings that is causing the most of the health effects in your population. Um, and this was from you know, the 2021 uh, sample survey of household budgets and labor force. And we went through that data and we allocated the time periods that people reported they were spending their time into indoor, outdoor workplace. And in the bottom graph, we applied this to our survey population to estimate the health impacts by really specifying how much of the how many individuals there were in each category of children less than 10, adolescents 10 to 18, adults 18 to 65, and adults older than 65, and then estimated what their exposures were and what their health impacts were. I'm going fast. Um, this, in fact, is the exposures by heating type. And the one thing I want to tell you here is it's not these exposures aren't really driven by the individual heating type in the home, as Jay said, but it's driven by the heating type of your neighbors around you and yourself. So it's really your neighborhood level concentration. And you can see there are differences and the, the error bars in, that are on or the whisker bars on these graphs really represent the differences across the spatial environment of Bishkek. They're not uncertainty. It's that these exposures vary depending where you are in the city, whether your neighbors are coal burners or whether your neighbors are uh, apartment dwellers. And this has a major impact and it really should inform how we address air pollution on a citywide level because it Individual choices are important, but it's also collective choices that really are going to be the only solution to reducing health impacts in the population. And how the green bar on the right really, uh, the green graph, sorry, on the right really show how these impacts in terms of DALIs were spread through the population. It is for the most part the very, very young that are impacted and the elderly. The peak of that graph is actually retirement age for most individuals and really showing the maximum health of impacts in that population. Within young youth and young adult populations, you would expect these people to have low impacts because these are very healthy individuals. They don't experience their health impacts from non-communicable disease outcomes. It's really, as you get older, as your body systems wear down, that you become more susceptible to the impacts of air pollution. So it's the young and the elderly that are the primary people that are affected. When you actually look at the rates, however, the rates in the first six days of life are the highest because this has relatively few individuals in that category. It's only six days of life for the population that is six days old. But really the impacts in terms of rates are very large in terms of lower respiratory infections. They're very vulnerable in this period of time. Um, now, a word about the health impact estimates. These are, uh, these are actual deaths. These are actual deaths that are reported by uh, the Ministry of Health and the Kyog uh, Statistical Network. What we're doing here is we're attributing uh, these deaths to a particular risk factors. So we're really accounting for how many of these actual deaths were likely to be caused by the air pollution exposures that people were experiencing at the time. With these deaths, we then went a step further and we uh, did uh, what was the, the first 
it was a contingent valuation study in Central Asia, I believe, that was done here in Bishkek, where we really assessed a local estimate of willingness to pay. And most of, uh, most of these uh, welfare loss or uh, loss of life years or productivity losses estimates are estimated using uh, United States willingness to pay data adjusted for GDP. Now, this, of course, is inappropriate because there are many other factors, beliefs, and perceptions that go into willingness to pay. And so we conducted the first locally derived estimates of willingness to pay using contingent valuation. And we can go more into the details on that, but really the bottom line is that using these estimates, we estimate that you know, there was about a 24, a 40, a 15 to $25 million loss in productivity losses or welfare losses in Bishkek alone as a result of these health impacts. Now, I covered a lot of issues pretty quickly, so uh, I hope that oh, yeah, if you have any questions, we'll talk about them at the end. Thank you very much, Rufus. Uh, so like, uh... Or is yours? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leka Isintaeva, and I am from International Organization for Migration. I am a communications and program manager. And uh, I'm mentioning that because this uh, air pollution study and its health impacts on internal migrants with it. Uh, was uh, designed as a baseline assessment uh, to see uh, the uh, knowledge, per the percentage knowledge about um, uh, health impacts of air pollution among internal migrants themselves. So um, let me show you the study, how it looks like, and you can also find it on our website, which is kyrgyzstan.iam.int. And it's available in two languages, in both in Kyrgyz, uh, Russian and uh, English. So here's the brief outline of my presentation. It's always uh, very challenging to be the last presenter as a lot of information is maybe going to be repetitive. Uh, but this outline actually uh, looks like the uh, outline of the study itself. So let me first uh, start with the uh, summary, and I will try to integrate the migration perspective. So a lot of uh, internal migrants have been moving here since the 90s, and these are uh, uh, people from the different regions of Kyrgyzstan. Uh, their economic conditions uh, weren't really good uh, where they lived, and that's why they have been moving to Bishkek in search of better opportunities and in search of better uh, public infrastructure, access to health services, access to social services. And ironically here, uh, living in the residential neighborhoods around Bishkek doesn't uh, mean that they have better infrastructure, unfortunately. And I will briefly talk about the methodology and maybe I will skip this uh, two last sections because they have been covered very much in depth by previous speakers. Uh, so as you know, Bishkek and Osh are the biggest cities and largest hubs for uh, internal migrants and international migrants as well. Uh, but 35% of Bishkek populations are actually internal migrants. Uh, IOM defines internal migration as the movement of people within a state, a country, involving the establishment of a new, temporary, or permanent residence. But whether they are living here permanently or temporarily, they are still affected by air pollution uh, health risks. And so the residential settlements, uh, residential areas or neighborhoods are often called uh, new settlements. And I uh, deeply disagree with this uh, definition because actually these settlements are not uh, any longer new. Uh, they have been there for uh, more than 30 years and even more than 40 years now. And they are the most affected uh, by air pollution because they're unlinked to public amenities 
And as was mentioned, uh, they lack uh, access to cities heating and uh, gas infrastructure, although there are some initiatives now to uh, install this gas infrastructure in the, uh, in the residential neighborhoods. So in Bishkek, we have 47 uh, residential neighborhoods. Uh, as you see on the map, the uh, Bishkek is divided uh, into four districts, administrative districts, and some of them are um, uh, better off in terms of air quality. And we saw the between the uh, number of people living in the residential neighborhood and air quality, because um, the more uh, the uh, households, uh, the more there's, uh, the more the heating was uh, cold and hence uh, worse air pollution. Uh, but we also uh, acknowledge that uh, we are located in the mountain valley, and which means that the air gets trapped. And that's why we have in the winter, uh, such a bad smoke. Uh, sanitary landfill uh, was causing, was contributing to air pollution, and of course we have us picked up by uh, different types of uh, pollutants. So we have uh, PM two point five from uh, coal heating and the uh, other CO and NO two uh, from the vehicles. Oops, what did they do? Okay. Uh... So the methodology uh, is uh, the household survey uh, among 615 households, uh, which is statistically representative of the population of uh, residential neighborhoods. We also conducted key informant interviews uh, and focus group discussions. Uh, so uh, these uh, air quality maps actually look uh, a lot like the previous uh, maps that you saw. Uh, the worst air pollution uh, is observed during the heating season. And here, uh, uh, here are the data for the uh, pollution from the vehicles. So uh, the, uh, let me uh, uh, talk about the demographic profile because for us it was interesting to see if uh, what are uh, who are these people what do they know about air pollution and uh, how can we since it was the study uh, before the information campaign uh, what should we address in the information campaign do they really know about the health impacts of air pollution or not. And so here we see that a lot of the uh, uh, neighborhood residents are from different parts of the country. Uh, and uh, that is the, the largest uh, percentage are from the Rhin region. Uh, the socioeconomic status is uh, not uh, very, um, uh, how to say, uh, it's, it's not really uh, the, uh, rich people and uh, uh, most of the people, they can only afford uh, food, utilities, uh, but uh, uh, expensive uh, things uh, may not be very uh, readily available for them. So uh, this is uh, very important when we uh, design interventions to see uh, whether we have cost-effective solutions for home insulation, uh, and uh, uh, for uh, heating sources. So um, most of the residential uh, neighborhoods, they use stoves, boilers, space heaters. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, this is uh, the most, uh, I guess, uh, for us was, was the most important finding, whether Respondents know about the uh, influence of air pollution on their house and uh, their own ratings, uh, their own knowledge. We used SF uh, short eight uh, survey. 
and you see that a lot of people uh, actually uh, experience difficulties uh, in regard to air pollution caused by air pollution. And the longer people live in the neighborhood, the worse the health symptoms are. So, uh, but what uh, what's really good is that internal migrants are willing to uh, do something about it, to change their behavior and uh, start uh, switching to cleaner energy, cleaner heating systems. 72% uh, are ready to participate in the sorting of solid waste, for example. They really want to green the spaces. And we saw from the surveys that sometimes uh, even uh, people may not know a lot about air pollution, but they think that uh, you know some of the times uh, they don't have asphalt roads or uh, basic things that they want to solve first and then uh, go uh, uh, on with solving uh, the air pollution problems. And, uh, but from the national government, we also see the willingness to act. And the, uh, I'll skip the slide. And uh, so the recommendations uh, uh, we developed were both for the government of Kyrgyzstan and uh, Bishkek uh, mayor's office. And, um, the uh, biggest recommendation is, I guess, uh, right now to uh, have a comprehensive plan of action and other organizations like UNEP and UNDP are also, and UNICEF are developing a roadmap. Uh, but for us, it's really important to uh, see uh, uh, and to um, mainstream migration in all this uh, uh, roadmap and recommendations and uh, make sure that uh, the solutions are uh, cost effective and something that people can afford uh, without uh, being too much uh, compromised. Apologies for the short presentation, uh, but uh, I'll be really happy to answer your questions uh, during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And no need to apologize for the short presentation. It's actually convenient uh, to have a bigger uh, amount of time for, for discussion. Um, all right. So before opening the floor, a um, couple of observations. One is that the, the three reports complement each other very nicely. Um, and um, another good thing is that they are converging on the main uh, messages. Um, so we're now Together with you know, the different organizations that uh, uh, produce these reports, we're sort of condensating the main messages into a 10-page document uh, that uh, uh, will be published shortly, um, and which aims to, well, first summarize in a more digestible way. I mean, instead of you know, having 100-page reports, you're going to have a 10-page uh, 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 document to go to. Uh, that's one. And the other goal uh, is to, you know, basically move from scientific evidence, which has now been put together into, well, what do we do now? Uh, uh, what is the action we need to tackle uh, uh, the uh, 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 air pollution in, uh, in, uh, in Bishkek? Um, so as I was saying, so consensus is on, number one reason is residential coal heating. It is very clear. Uh, this has been triangulated uh, 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 through different uh, uh, methods. Second cause is uh, uh, transport, uh, particularly diesel uh, vehicles. Uh, there's also no debate on uh, on that. Now, since this is a you know scientific conference, where we're also interested in in what we don't know, um, and 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 that's probably you know the most interesting uh, uh, part in this in this in this format. So there's two aspects that I think lack uh, or, or we could go deeper, or, or at least we haven't reached consensus. One is the cost. Uh, so Jay uh, and Rufus uh, get to $20 million per year. Um, uh, Katya was mentioning a, a, a figure of 388 million uh, of uh, healthcare expenditure. So there, there's a variety of methods there leading to very different figures. Um, and, 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 you know, it would be interesting to have the perspective of the, of the presenters 
on that? What's the, you know, is it, is it, is, is there a way to converge uh, or is it not uh, 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 necessary uh, to, to, to get there? So that's my first question. Second question is, okay, so we know residential heating and, uh, and uh, transport are the most important drivers. What about, what comes next? Uh, so the coal power plants is important. Uh, waste burning is important, probably less so now that the fire has been extinguished uh, uh, in the landfill in the north. But you know what? You know what are your views on uh, on uh, on on the relative magnitudes uh, of uh, of that? So perhaps I'll 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 start with uh, 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 well Jay uh, Jay and Rufus. Uh, do you have views on uh, on those aspects? In terms of the different cost estimates, the different cost estimates, uh, one reflects, a, in a very simple way, one of course reflects the whole of Kyrgyzstan and one reflects Bishkek city. There are, other, there are also other important differences in, in terms of the, the health impact estimates that were estimated. And you know, when we used our infiltration methods, our health impact estimates are lower, and so our costs are going to be, the productivity loss is going to be lower. And then the third part is when you use willingness to pay, you know, if you're using the United States willingness to pay adjusted by GDP, that causes a these are quite different to locally derived estimates that are really based on people's beliefs and uh, in Bishkek. And this causes a third area for difference between those estimates. And we would have to really reconcile those. By far the biggest aspect of uh, these uh, economic costs is the, is the welfare loss or the productivity cost. And this is the avoided productivity that you would get uh, that you get from air pollution relative to a healthy population. So, it, you know, based on the counterfactual. Uh, the actual treatment costs, which is a second part of that equation, is actually quite small in relation to those productivity costs. And so we don't include those treatment costs in our estimates, but it's possible to, in it's very possible to include those. But the main burden of those, of those, Productivity loss estimates is avoided productivity. From from my medical hygiene view, migration to the Bishkek is uh, under at least three impacts. Uh, first is uh, changing of climate. So we have special table and uh, gap table of the climate changes, for example, from very south or from mountain to this. It's one impact. Second impact is uh, uh, social stress, social, if they transfer from village to the big town. So for good uh, scientific results, it uh, would be need to divide it group. So for example, one group from the center of the Osh to the center of Bishkek. So the same social impact. So we think about the other impact. So uh, the other, so several impacts from the one place to the not polluted part. So very neighbor of the, our town. So if we have at least four different group, only after this, in, in the uh, scientific uh, study, we may uh, results and uh, good results about pollution, climate, or social, which percent of it impact to healthy or change of health. Thank you. Uh, this resonates with, with the IOM uh, study particularly. No, uh, So are the, the migrants particularly in the areas that are the most polluted right so so actually yes uh actually yes a lot of migrants who are moving uh here they're forming a so-called migration circle and uh they mainly start living in the 
neighborhoods around the city and not in the central parts of the city. And so you're very right that uh, they also experience mental health problems, issues with social integration and inclusion in the city. And it's, it's a very important thing to note when we do awareness raising campaigns and social support system for um, people who are coming to live here. And now we see also that international migrants from South Asia, from India and Pakistan, Bahrain and different other countries who are coming here to study as, inter uh, as students, uh, mainly in medical universities, they also choose to live in the neighborhoods that are cheaper for them. So these are not central parts of the city. For example, we have scientific study of the Kyrgyz village, a very close relation who live in village and the other his relatives live in the center of Bishkek. The difference of uh, cardiovascular disease, three times higher, is not a pollution, it's social stress. Uh, hello, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. However, I have uh, one question about the, uh, the timeline. Uh, so we know that um, in order to, to look uh, for, for the impact on health, uh, we need some time, like the exposure. So I, I just wanted to ask, like in your study, uh, what was the timeline when you, like uh, when, when uh, the data that you were using, uh, the timeline of the data that you used, and if you um, did like the lack, like um, accounted for, for, for the for the time for the time. Yes, that's a more complicated question, but yes. Uh... There are lag times, of course, with many of these disease outcomes, and we use, you know, what are conventional lag times that are incorporated in global burden of disease estimates to incorporate these. But it's clear that, you know, your incidence of COPD or, or obstructive pulmonary disease occurs throughout your life, whether whereas low respiratory infections are very acute diseases they occur they can occur within days you know because of compromised systems so yes we do incorporate the the lag times and we use sort of conventions to incorporate you know, what those lag times are and how much of the disease we're going to account for in in the time period that we're accounting so we really estimate those disease outcomes for a single year um, by estimating it, it's actually about 80 percent of the disease outcome that you're accounting for but we do incorporate the the timeline of effects thank you and we're going to take one question online i see someone has raised their hand uh can you unmute yourself and ask your question yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Julius. Uh, my name is Kamal Bekarim Shakir from uh, Manas University. And thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. It's uh, one of the, I guess, for all the inhabitants of Bishkek City, is one of the uh, priority issues as air pollution. I just wonder about the policy implications. Uh, definitely one of the greatest contributions to the air pollution is a residential heating using the coal. So, but based on the maybe other countries' experience, like Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar, do you think that we should consider, you know, the uh, coal, coal processing techniques, you know, that to use in by the households in in uh, for the residential heating? Because just think about not only the Bishkek but other main cities of the of the country, also like Oshal, about maybe other countries. We see also the air pollution is increasing, and it's it's. Uh, I don't think that in a very near future we can uh, we can uh, uh, keep away the cold because uh, that's really difficult for the ordinary households to use other sources for the for the heating. Uh, thank you very much. I may take that one actually. Um, yes. Uh, so in, I mean, in in Mongolia, the experience of, of uh, you know manufacturing and 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 supplying coal briquettes to household has lowered slightly emissions of pm 2.5 but it actually raised emissions of uh, uh sulfur di dioxide um that's one the other thing is that you know as long and it, this coal is subsidized and as long as it's subsidized you know people you know consume a lot of it and don't switch to cleaner alternatives 
Um, and the third uh, um, point is that th there is actually funding out there. Uh, there is funding uh, from uh, global climate funds, and, and I speak in the plural here, by uh, countries and corporates purchasing carbon credits, the development banks such as ADB, the World Bank, BRD, there is funding uh, uh, available. Uh, the question is how to tap it uh, 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 properly uh, and, 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 and quickly uh, so we can phase out uh, 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 coal uh, uh, as, as quickly as possible. But that's not, I wouldn't be as pessimistic uh, uh, as you are uh, in, in, in the ability to, uh, to achieve that. Rufus. I think one of the things that is under-recognized from the Mongolia experience is that they are suffering an epidemic of carbon monoxide poisoning as a result of the briquettes that they have in, that the, they've been distributing in their homes. You know, even this winter, there were 50 deaths uh, within, so in some cases, entire families that died uh, from the carbon monoxide poisoning. And this is a function of their coal. The second point is, is their air clean? By any objective metric, Mong Ulaanbaatar's air is not clean. They still have about the same health effects that they have before. So this also calls into question of, is, is that a real solution? The third point is that we have evaluated different options like heat pumps and shown that actually on a cost per household basis, they were cheaper than uh, the coal in, in Ulaanbaatar and they likely would be cheaper here as well when you take, when you implement them effectively. Um, and so there are sustainable solutions and uh, I'm sorry that you didn't see the talk downstairs um, just before lunch that really did a much more broad evaluation of heat pumps and, and the economics of heat pumps where they were the leading solution to in terms of cost effectiveness. Thank you. Uh, maybe you just one last question for uh, Katya, uh, who's online. Um, so Katya, in the, in the emissions inventory uh, that you have, you're showing that in terms of sheer emissions, uh, the coal power plant is not that big of a deal relative to the rest. Um, and then you're saying, well, I mean, the stack is 160 meter high. So is that... so? so so are, are you saying that even before taking into account uh, the dispersion factor, the better dispersion factor of the, of the, the, the coal power plant, uh, it's, already, it's already less of a problem? And I guess once you've taken into account the dispersion, uh, how, how, you know, is, is, there, is, is that any problem at all <laughs> in the end? Yeah, sure, sure it has. That's a good good. Good, que good question and good point. So of course, actually when we, we have to remember that there they are emissions and then pollutant concentrations on the air. So they are different, different things. The emissions cause the concentrations, but, uh, but the higher the actually emissions are released to the air, the lower the concentrations are on the ground level where people are exposed and where what we are breathing the air. But actually, when you when you said there are actually big emissions coming out of the CHP plant, but the magnitude of the and the impact, the magnitude of impact of for of them to the current uh, concentration levels in Bishkek, they are not significant compared as we discussed to the domestic heating emissions. They are very very high. They are actually now non-dominating let's put it that way and the traffic traffic as well but um of course it's uh it's it's uh there are emissions but but at the moment i believe that now when 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 you are planning now in in kyrgyzstan the what we need to do to tackle the air pollution you want to make the cost kind of benefit studies so that with the let uh, when we put some investments for the cleaner technologies, what's the output that we are getting out? So if we are now focusing on the CHP plant, then the impact, even you would, um, 
remove, remove the whole CHP plant and, and install the, of course, the uh, would be nice to have renewable energy, windmills and, and solar power and so on. But, but nevertheless, if you still have the domestic heating as it is at the moment, you wouldn't see that drastic difference. But of course, now when, when, when tackling first those ones that you can get the biggest impact to the better air quality, so, so focusing on this domestic heating, it was only the, it was nice presentation, Jay, thank you very much for that. It was, was it 25% uh, of the, uh, about one quarter of the houses are heated by this uh, burning the, the the sulfur on the on the on the stove. So basically, that part uh, it is causing now, uh, let's say the majority of the of the high PM two point five pollution in the in in the uh, suburban areas. Which is of course very important as well because when people stay home, you are not just like traffic. We spend in the traffic certain time, then we go home, we go to the office, and so on. But uh, when people are exposed to the high concentrations, also at their home, that's that's the long exposure, and and that's why. But as you ask about the CHP plant, of course, it's a one one emission source. It's also big emission source, and emissions of course go somewhere. Even though I don't don't uh, come to the breeding level in Bishkek, of course there is then the long range transportation um, uh, of the emissions and so on. So of course they have the impact as well, and there is a lot of carbon dioxide also coming out that impacts to the to the um, climate change. So at the some point it's also good to have the strategy how to how to also reduce the emissions from the CHP plant. But I wouldn't say that it would be the priority at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Katya. And that uh, concludes uh, the session. We're, we're already 10 minutes late, sorry. <laughs>